It's hard to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Why don't you try again? You want me to do it? Okay, I pull together here. Together, you two can learn. There you go. Push it down really hard. I'll help you. You did it. Good job. High five. There you go. Well, good morning, everybody. Keep trying. <laughs> Ask for help. Yes, will do. Well, um, so this morning, we're going to be jumping into a short series on the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And, um, <clears throat> well, yeah, so just, just a little bit about that, and then I have another announcement to share with you guys that kind of ties into this. Um, and then, and then we'll jump into Ezra and Nehemiah. So Ezra and Nehemiah is, uh, it's actually historically was seen as one book. And so we're going to tackle them together as one story. We're going to spend probably the next four weeks looking at this. So we're not going to do like a verse by verse or a chunk by chunk. Um, but we're going to just pull some themes out of the story and talk about them for the next four weeks. Um, and part of the reason why we wanted to do that, so some of the major themes of Ezra and Nehemiah really are about uh, restoration and rebuilding, and uh, it's a lot more than just the story of building a wall or building a temple. It's also the story of rebuilding the identity of a people, reestablishing a culture of worship within the people of God, reestablishing faithfulness and righteousness and holiness as values for the people. So it's all of those things, um, and there's obviously a lot more to the story because there's some 20 or 30 chapters to, to Ezra and Nehemiah. But that's what the story is about. And we wanted to take some time to focus in on this because we're actually going to be doing, um, well, so this is the next thing that I wanted to share with you guys is, uh, so myself personally and some of the other leaders of our church have been um, just dreaming and praying about a different way for leadership to work in our church. And uh, this, so this announcement may, for, for some of you guys, it may be kind of like, well, that's cool, sounds good. For others, it may be, it may s sound a little bit more significant than that. Um, I feel like there's going to be a lot of changes for me personally and for some of our other leaders. Um, there may or may not be big changes for people who are part of the church. I don't know. But, but we are going through, we're going to be going through a process of basically redefining um, the way some of the leadership roles work in our church. Obviously, we've licensed Gail as a pastor. We're actually going to be licensing a few more pastors over the next six months or so. Um, and uh, I, I should say also, Mark, do we have the, those handouts? We don't, but we can get them and we can email them to you. So why don't we send that out this week? We'll email that. So there's a little one-page document that explains what some of those changes are going to be. Um, but really, I think at the heart of, um, of why we're making some of these changes is, I think it's important, well, we were, we were just talking in the back about doing work that you enjoy, right? And I think it's really important for people to be doing work that they're passionate about and that they're gifted in. Um, and when you line those things up, I think that that's a really powerful thing, right? When people are doing what they're good at and doing what they what produces joy in them. And so that's really at the heart of what we're trying to do with, with the way we want leadership to work in our church is to kind of put people in the right places to do the things that, that give them joy and that also really help us to advance our mission as a church um, more effectively. And so, you know, the, like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not, like, leaving the church, uh, but my role is going to shift in focus. I'll still be kind of, like, the primary person responsible for preaching and teaching on Sunday morning, but my role really is going to focus a lot more on leadership development and, and engaging with people who are, who are leading or wanting to lead in the church. Um, and then we're also going to be putting... Uh, so Gail is actually going to be stepping into our missional pastor role. So she's going to be focusing on, you know, we, in, our, in, in the language of our mission, we say that we want to teach people in the way of King Jesus. And one of the things that that looks like is effectively serving our neighbors. And so that really will be Gail's focus as a pastor is helping all of us as a church to effectively serve our neighbors. Um, so again, we're going to be kind of giving some different people some different defined roles uh, and um, giving me a little bit more def definition in my role, 
And uh, again, I'm really excited about it. It does mean some changes for me personally and what, what I'm going to be doing and what I'm gonna be thinking about and focusing on. Um, I don't know, am I missing anything, Mark? I probably, I probably should have asked that question before I stood up here to talk. Um, but, but if you guys have questions about this, we're gonna talk about this again over the next few weeks. Um, there's an email that will come out to you and if, you're, if you have any kinds of questions either out of curiosity or concern or wanting to get more information or more details, absolutely, you can pull me aside personally, you can send me an email, you can talk to any of the leaders of our church. Um, yeah. Yes, Mark. It's on our website. And it's on our website. Yeah, so there's plenty of places to get access to information about it. And again, our, like our hope is that this actually does change things, right? That it, that it that it produces joy in ministry for the people who are leading in our church. That it produces fruitfulness in our mission for you know the work that we want to do as a community. Um, that th those are the things that we hope to see happen. But also, we're not you know we're we're not expecting to see um, you know like radically painful changes for, for the congregation or anything like that. But again, it's, it's something that I'm excited to stand in front of you and tell you about, and I'm excited that it's happening. Uh, and certainly I would encourage you guys to be praying about that because there, these are some big, big changes that we're making, at least in terms of how, how leadership works here. Sound good? Cool? All right. All right. Well, so we're going to be talking about, no, oh, I went the wrong direction. We're going to be talking about Ezra and Nehemiah this morning, and as I said, Ezra and Nehemiah, the the, the Jewish um, scripture would have treated this as a single book. Um, it ended up being later split into two chunks, because the, the first, well, actually, the way the story works is the first maybe six chapters focus on Zerubbabel and, and Joshua, who come back and focus on rebuilding the temple, and then the next six chapters or so focus on Ezra the scribe who comes and he teaches the law to the Jewish people and then the last half of the book is focused on Nehemiah who comes and rebuilds the wall. And so that's basically the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, but it actually spans, the, the whole book spans 100 years, right? So this is a long story. It spans five Persian kings who play prominently in the story. Um, and <clears throat> really, it's, it's the story of, of God sovereignly making available a way for his people to come back from exile to their homeland and to reestablish them as a people there. That's really what the story of Ezra and Nehemiah is about. Um, and again, it's about you know, rebuilding physical things like a wall and a temple, but it's also about reestablishing spiritual realities like worship and the identity of God's people as, well, faithful, holy, righteous people who are in relationship with God, right? So it's about all of those things. Um, but also it's a story of leadership and opposition, right? There's some really key places in the story where both people from outside the Jewish community and even people from inside the Jewish community are resisting what is going on in the story, resisting the, the leadership of Zerubbabel, Joshua, Ezra, and Nehemiah as they're attempting to be faithful to, to what God has directed them to do. And so that's kind of our, our, our themes um, that we're going to be digging into over the next few weeks talking about Ezra and Nehemiah. But this morning, we're going to go in a little bit of a different direction, right? So this is, this is my working title for this morning's message, Rebuilding in the Debris of Catastrophic Failure, right? So, <laughs> so hopefully that you're all excited now to, <laughs> to dig into to the story of... Um, of Ezra and Nehemiah, and I think, so this is a story of restoration, which is a hopeful story, but it, the, the setting starts with the reality of, well, yeah, so I, I've, you know, I've been living on the west side now for, I guess, around a decade, and we've been in the city of Buffalo for like 15 years, and Personally, I've watched the West Side as a neighborhood improve and resurge and see positive changes happening here. And it fills me with a lot of hope, right? Like I showed up and, you know, there weren't any businesses really on Grant Street. It was just a bunch of boarded up shops. And now, like, there's a lot of economic activity. There's a lot of good things happening. You know, there's a lot less drugs and violence. And, but, but when I talk to people who have lived in this neighborhood for 40 years, or 50 years, or 60 years, 
I think they're positive about the changes, but they also remember what it used to look like and they know that it still doesn't look like that, right? And so I still sometimes, you know, get that sense of, oh yeah, that's right. Like there was something really beautiful here that was lost, right? There was a thriving, healthy community that really actually got gutted. And we're in a time of restoration, which is exciting as Christians to be a part of something like that. But there's the reality of the loss of, of so much of people's lives that also is represented, not just in our neighborhood, but I mean, that's the story of Buffalo, right? And, and so, like, that's the same story for the, the people of God being returned by God to their homeland, which, again, it's exciting. We're coming back. We're rebuilding. We're restoring. But also, man... This used to be this beautiful, thriving place. This used to be where the temple was, and now there's nothing. These walls used to be strong. This used to be, you know, a community of, of people who had a, a strong culture, and, and all of that has disappeared. And, and the reality is, is that the desolation that the, the Jewish people are dealing with is ultimately the result of their own moral failure their own um, unwillingness to be faithful to God's covenant with them, right? And so it really is, it's a hopeful story. I think we're going to spend three weeks talking about, about the hopefulness of, of being a part of restoration, but today we do need to focus in on the fact that this whole thing is predicated on the fact that the Jewish people had failed in their, their covenant relationship with God and had dealt with the catastrophic um, well, the catastrophic judgment for their sin that had befallen on them. And so that return to Jerusalem, return from exile, is certainly a, a, a joyful one, but it's also about confronting cat catastrophic personal and social failure, right, and coming in to deal with the consequences of that. So, sound like fun, right? <laughs> Maybe not sounds like fun, but definitely sounds like important work. Right? Sounds like the kind of thing that we should be willing to do. And so again, there's this, this the, 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 the beginning of this is really about restoration. And uh, like I said, there's, um, I think, 26 chapters. So we're not going to get to dig into all of it today. We're not even going to get to dig into all of it over the next four weeks. I would encourage you, though, to read it all. Right? It doesn't take too long to read Ezra and Nehemiah. So you should read through it. But I want to read the first few verses of Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation through his realm and also to put it into writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Right? And so this is, at the time, the most powerful person on the planet who is the king of Persia, who is essentially moved by God to rebuild and to restore what uh, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed some generation earlier. And he has issued this decree to the Jewish people saying, hey, return, go rebuild it. I'm giving you permission and my blessing to go rebuild the temple. And I'm telling all of the subjects of my kingdom, hey, give these guys some money to go rebuild what they lost, right? So this, like that's... That's pretty cool, right? This is, this is an amazing beginning to this story. And again, God is moving on the heart of Cyrus. Um, also, you know, if, if we look back at the, at the story, we know that, that uh, Scripture gives God the credit for moving the, the Babylonians in to bring um, judgment on the Jewish people in the first place. And so this whole story is a story about God dealing with his people, and this, this theme of God's intervention in the story of rebuilding the city and reestablishing the culture and rebuilding the temple and reestablishing worship, it comes in again and again and again where, you know, we, we saw um, John helping Nora put pieces in and, you know, it's kind of like, well, keep trying, keep, keep, keep putting the pieces in, but also, like, don't, don't hesitate to ask for help. And the Jewish people get 
um, they get into situations where the, they're, they're un unable to complete the work without God's divine intervention to make things happen for them. And so that's a part of, of what this story is about. It's about God sovereignly acting um, through, through the nations of the earth to, to establish his people and to make a place for them and to restore them. And so that's, that's a, an exciting thing. Um, and again, we, we have um, these several key leaders who are people who are pushing into this call of God on their lives to rebuild and to restore. But like I said, as much as it's a hopeful story, it's also a story about, um, well, dealing with the desolation that was caused by Israel's sin. Right? And I want to read another passage to you. So this comes after um, some work had already been done. They had built the altar and uh, had just laid the temple for the foundation. So this is before Ezra has arrived and this is before Nehemiah has arrived. But um, Zerubbabel is the first governor who has been commissioned by uh, the Persian king to come and lead people. And Joshua is the first priest to return uh, and so they've come with a group of exiles from Babylon back to, um, back to Jerusalem. They've built an altar, they've started worship, and they've laid the foundation for the temple, and they have their first worship service. And that's what I want to read to you. So when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Right, and so this is, um, I don't know, it's kind of a crazy picture. I think you could imagine that though, right? If you put yourself in, I don't know, I mean, this, is, this building doesn't hold the same place to us as a church that, that the, the Jewish temple did for um, the Jewish people. But you can imagine if, you know, this church burnt down and we, you know, came back and like put a cornerstone out there and then had a worship service. It would be like, all right, like we're back, but also we're not really back yet. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, we're back, but also, man, what about what we lost or what about the work that still has to go on. And there's, I've read comment, commentators about that passage who have said that maybe it was just that, that like they remembered what was lost, but also there are people who have pointed at the fact that the new temple was much smaller than the old temple. And even though it wasn't built, it was just the foundation. There was the reality that what was going to be rebuilt would lack the same glory of what had been present before. And so there's just, there's real loss there's real genuine loss that, that, the, that God's people are going to have to deal with because of their sin. They have sinned and it's going to cost them. And even though God is restoring and redeeming them, the, there, there is this real mourning of the consequences of sin that's taking place. Right. And I think this is, this is a part of the story that really needs to be pushed into. So the Jewish people were faithless to God, and that's why they had been removed in the first place, right? Uh, the Jewish people return to a land where their neighbors don't really actually want them there, don't like them, don't want them to return. And again, like this is... They're, there are all of these places of opposition and signs of disfavor that the Jewish people are having to push into because of their own sinful decisions. And ultimately, even one of the, the recurring themes of Ezra and Nehemiah is the decisions of some of the, the, the Jewish people themselves, even continuing through all of this rebuilding, right? God has 
moved on the heart of Cyrus, and we'll see um, later in the story that there are several Persian kings that God continues to move in their hearts to, to make a way for the Jewish people, right? So there's all of this crazy providential ways that God is showing up for the nation, and yet there are still people who are refusing to obey God's commandments in their lives. And this ends up being one of the very things that Ezra and Nehemiah have to continue to deal with, right? Is, no, guys, we, we got to follow God. We have to be faithful to God. And so there's just this continual wrestling with the consequences of sin and coming face to face with the fact that, man, we not only have we not been faithful to God and we're dealing with the consequences of that, but we continue as a people to not be faithful to God and we're dealing with the consequences of that and we have to root that out so that we can be the people that God want, wants us to be. All right, so that's, that's, that's an ugly reality and in a, in a minute we'll talk about what that means for us as people today, right, as, as followers of Jesus. But the last thing that I wanna point out just as kind of a, a theme of this story, so this is a picture of a shepherd um, but uh, you, you guys are familiar with the, the parable from Jesus about, you know, the lost sheep and how a shepherd will leave the 99 sheep to go and find the lost sheep and return them. And this story of Ezra and Nehemiah, it really is the, that story. It's, it's a story certainly of, um, well, of persistence and of moral courage on the part of some of the Jewish people to pursue God's plan for their lives. But it's not really a story of the Jewish people saving themselves. This is not a story of the Jewish people, you know, out of their own kind of gumption making it work. This is a story of God showing up and being faithful to people who were not being faithful to him. This is a story of God making a way for a people who were not capable of making a way for themselves, right? That is the story of the return from exile, is God saying, I love you, you're my people, and even though you have been faithless to me, I will still be faithful to you. I will pursue you, I will redeem you, I will restore you to the place that I had you in because I love you and because you're my people. Not because of your strength or your beauty or your power, any of those things, but because I love you, I'm going to do this. And so that story from Jesus about God, about who God is, about what the Father is like, and and, and, and ultimately what, what that did for Jesus in his ministry. Jesus was like that too, right? He's like his father in that he's going to pursue the lost people, not because of how great or wonderful they are, but because of how deep his love is for them, right? And that's the story of Ezra and Nehemiah is the story of God saying, I'm going to be faithful to you when you aren't faithful to me. And I'm going to move the hearts of powerful kings even when you're weak and you don't have authority or power to do something for yourself. I'm gonna do it on your behalf. I'm gonna make it happen. Um, I mean, it's, it's actually one of the, there's a, a couple of cool places in the, in the stories where, so some of, the, some of the people around Jerusalem don't like that the Jewish people are back and rebuilding the city. And so they stir up trouble and they send letters to the king saying, hey, these Jewish people are going to cause problems for you. Don't let them do what they're doing. And in certain places, some of the Persian kings put a stop to the work. And then in, in other times, they kind of dig in and, and, and realize, oh, no, actually, actually, we, we want the Jews to, to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city. And um, some of the very... So the, some of the enemies of the Jewish people write a letter saying, hey, put... Put, put an end to what they're doing, and it ends up causing some of the Persian kings to say, okay, not only can they keep doing what they're doing, but all you people who wrote these letters, you guys have to pay for the work that they're doing. Like, you have to actually provide, you know, timbers to build and, and money to, to build and food for them to eat while they're working. And so, again, you just see God's hand at work in this situation, creating favor for his people in ways that they really haven't done anything to deserve. And so that, that's just an essential part of this story. Like I said, I wish, I, 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 I realized in preparing for this, I'm like, man, how am I gonna preach a sermon on 30 chapters of scripture in like 20 minutes? So please read, read through this. There's a lot of good stuff there. Um, but I, I wanna talk to you guys about what this, what this means for us, right? So this is, um, you guys are probably familiar with Thomas Edison's light bulb story, right? He tried to, he was, he's the guy who invented a light bulb and he famously failed 
I don't know, hundreds or thousands of times, and somebody had asked him about that, and he said, no, I didn't, I didn't fail a thousand times. I success, you know, a thousand times I successfully figured out how not to build a light bulb. That was his quote, right? Um, but he, he eventually succeeded in, in producing a light bulb. And I, my understanding is that Thomas Edison was not known for his humility, quite the opposite. That's my understanding. I'm not an not a, a expert on his life. But, but I think there's something in that that I, that I, I think can point at what I think, what, like a lesson we can pull from this story, right? Um, there is a clear, there's a clear conviction on the part, particularly of the leaders in, in this story, of Ezra and Nehemiah in particular. They are resolute in their pursuit of the, the, the call of God on their lives, right? God has sent me to teach the law to his people. I'm going to do it. I'm going to deal with whatever I have to deal with. I'm going to pursue this thing. Nehemiah, I'm here to rebuild the walls. I'm here to teach the people to actually practice justice. Like, I am going to do this, and there is nothing that's going to stop me. I mean, there's a scene where Nehemiah steps in really to ask the king for favor. And once you start to learn some of the backstory, you realize that this is a king who Nehemiah didn't know if he was walking into hey, the bank account's open, go build the walls, or I can't believe you just asked me that off with your head, right? Like like these are people who were exercising great moral courage and conviction to pursue what they felt like God wanted them to pursue. And yet it's also coupled with this, it's, it's a humility, a willingness to confront their own failure and the failure of their people and to really look at it and really deal with it. Right? And I think that that's something for us that doesn't come accidentally. We, we can't be those kinds of people by accident. We have to choose that. Right? We have to choose to say, yeah, I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to turn away from the promises of God in my life. And I'm going to push in and deal with the places where I have failed or where, you know, Things are hard. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to ignore that. I'm going to push into that. And there's a choice that we have to make. But, but again, it's a choice. So this is where it's not the Thomas Edison story, right? It's not about pushing into our own ingenuity or our own intelligence or our own ability. This is about having conviction that comes from our reliance upon the grace of God in our lives, that we trust in him, that we believe that he loves us, that, that we're, we're not going to let go of his promise in our lives because of who he is, not because of who we are. Does that make sense? And so I think we have to ask those questions, like what tempts us not to be this kind of a person? What tempts us to avoid dealing with sin in our lives or with failure in our world? Um, I mean, I know for me, I just don't like it. It's painful. It's ugly. I don't want to deal with those things. I want to ignore them and pretend that they're not there. Maybe for you, it's something else. I don't know. But what what tempts us to be those kinds of people? And are we willing to say, I'm not going to allow that temptation to become real in my life? What tempts us to ignore God's grace, to pretend that we can solve problems on our own, right? And (laughs) I don't know. Sometimes, Sometimes I just think I'm all that right? I'm sure some of you guys deal with that too. It's like, no, nah, I got this. I've been, you, you, you guys, um, I, I've, I've shared before that I've been, I've been going to jujitsu with my daughter. So I've, I've been, uh, back into a, like a wrestling scene, which, you know, like I was a college wrestler and, and over the last couple of weeks, I've had all sorts of opportunities for my ego to flare up. I'm like, oh yeah, like I'm pretty good at this, but, but Usually within the space of 30 seconds, I also have opportunities for somebody to, to not usually with words, explain to me why I'm not all that. <laughs> so, so I've had a lot of those experiences of like, yeah, I'm, this is who I am. And then, no, that's, that's not who I am. I, I actually am not, I'm not all that. I'm a 42-year-old out of shape ex-wrestler. <laughs> that's what I am. <laughs> so anyway... We, like we want to be people who our moral courage and our conviction is rooted in who God is in our lives, not some false image that we have of how awesome we are. That kind of speaks for itself, right? Can you guys read that in the back? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Who wants that job? <laughs> I guess you'd bring a book, right? And a cup of coffee. 
<laughs> You're gonna sit at that table? Right, so, so I mean this is, I think this is where the rubber he, hit, hits the road for us when we're, when we're talking about, okay, well how, how do we put this into practice? Well, we've got this story of Ezra and Nehemiah, um, these men who led their people into rebuilding in the debris of the catastrophic failure of their people. Right? And that's, again, that's a hopeful task. That's a courageous task. That's a, a worthy task. But it's also about taking responsibility for failure. It's about dealing with it. Right? It's about accepting responsibility and not pointing the finger at others. It's not fun. I don't think it can ever be fun. I don't think you can ever get to a point where you enjoy it. But I do think that it can be something that we learn to push into, right? I mean, you can do hard things. That's, that's a part of anything good that you've ever had in your life. You've never had anything good in your life that didn't have some sort of sacrifice or cost or, or pain or conviction that was required, right? That's just how that works. Um, and so that really, I think, is, is where the rubber hits the road for us as a people, is that's the kind of people God wants us to be. We're, we're supposed to be the kind of people that get into that line, that's a part of what it means to follow Jesus, right? And um, yeah, like I know that it's just an ice cream cone, right? I get that it's not really that big of a failure, but somehow this picture just captured for me kind of like the, dis not despair, what's the right, I don't know what the right word is, but just that kind of like, like utter disappointment, yes, you know, especially you can imagine if you're like four, this would crush you, you know, then you would just stare at it and not go anywhere. Anyway, so I know that that's not maybe the best picture for all of us of failure. Maybe, maybe there's something less comical um, and more deep. Uh, yeah, how many of you guys, does anybody watch uh, American Idol? Okay, so I don't watch American Idol, but every now and then with my kids, we'll watch American Idol audition fails. Have you guys ever watched those? <laughs> right? Those are horrible and amazing all at the same time. But it's, you know, people who think they can sing who can't. Right, and they come face to face with that reality in front of millions of people. That's probably the worst place to do that. Um, you know, one of the things that as an athlete was the most helpful to me is when my coach would pull me aside after a loss and unpack what happened. Now, you just got beat in something that you've put a lot of time and energy into being successful at and you lost, you failed. Well, let's talk about why. Right, um, I would say any time I've ever had a fight with my wife where I've really had to come in, I mean, you know, mo most of the time it's not my fault, right? <laughs> where I've had to come to terms with the fact that uh, I'm a jerk. And it's, that never feels good ever. And there's always that temptation in there to push that realization away, to say, I, it's her fault, not my fault. All her, 100%, her fault. None of it's my fault. And there's always that choice of, you know, am I going to be somebody who looks at my own moral failure and really is willing to acknowledge that it's there and to allow God to speak to me so that I can actually become the person, the man that God wants me to be, the husband that God wants me to be. And that's, that's not fun to sit with your failure. It's never fun. I don't think it can ever be enjoyable, but it's also incredibly important that we are people who are willing to do that. Uh, so there's one last passage I want to read out of, um, out of Ezra. This is Ezra chapter 9. And there's several places, several passages like this in this story, but this is the one I'm going to read. This is Ezra 9, uh, there you go, 5 through 15. Yeah, that's a good chunk. That's why it's the wrong one. I'm in Nehemiah 9. You guys don't want to read that. Here we go. Ezra, Ezra 9. Then at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement and with my tunic and cloak torn and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed. I'm too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up my face to you because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our ancestors until now, our guilt has been great. 
Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings, as it is today. But now for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, our God, what can we say after this? For we have forsaken the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said, the land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we then break your commands again and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? Lord, the God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a, rem as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it not one of us can stand in your presence. Well, that's a crazy prayer, Right? My guess would be, though, I, I would imagine that most of you don't pray like that all the time, but my guess would be that you've probably prayed like that at some times in your life. And I think for us to be people who are choosing to rely on God's grace in our lives, that means that there are those moments where we have to be willing to look at our own sin and mourn it and ask God's forgiveness for it and ask God to help us to deal with it, for him, for him to be the one ultimately who deals with it. And that's a part of what it means to be people who are faithful. So I know that's, a, that's, not, an easy, that's not an easy message. I think the, the one, maybe the hopeful note that I'll put um, maybe as a period on this, and then we'll take some time to reflect, is just that this is as... As hard as that is to acknowledge and to accept and to enter into, it comes in the middle of God's invitation to restoration. It comes as a part of God's process of healing and redemption for his people, right? And so as much as it may be unpleasant, it's the unpleasant part of a glorious process for us. So we're going to take some time and do this. Um, so the, the first is to identify a personal failure where I'm willing to dig into it more deeply and ask God to help me, right? And again, I recognize that it takes, it probably takes courage just to even like read that sentence and think about applying it to yourself, right? Um, and then, so, but, but I'm encouraging you to do it right, to actually identify a place where you would say, man, I, like, I've just failed here as a person. I'm not who I want to be, and God, I actually want you to help me deal with this, right, and you don't have to start with the biggest thing. You could start with the smallest thing. That's okay, but to identify a place where it's like, okay, this is a place where I want God to help me, um, and then to actually tell God in prayer, okay, I want to I wanna deal with this. I want to look at this. I want you to help me to, to enter into what it looks like for me to become, you know, a more faithful person in this place in my life. Is that, is that all right? Again, I know that's like heavy work to do, um, but we'll take the next few minutes and just sit with those two things. So Lord, I do pray that you'd come and help us to be people who are willing to look at our failure, whether it's ours as an individual or even ours as a people, Help us to be willing to do that. And God, would you help us in it? Would you heal us? Would you redeem us? Would you 
restore us. So we just pray that you would come now. don't have to deal with our sins alone in isolation, Lord, but that you have brought us together as a family in you. Um, help us to reach out to each other in love, asking for prayer and um, accountability as we move toward more wholeness and restoration in our own lives, Lord. Um, help us to lovingly with so much grace in unconditional ways to help each other to grow and to walk more into the beauty that you see in us, Lord. Help us to see it in each other. Thank you, Lord. If you guys want to stand, we'd love to have you stand with us as we sing some songs of praise.
tear down borders. Tear down borders, build a home. Tear down hatred, build a throne. Let's come together and worship. No, tear down borders. Tear down borders, build a home. Tear down hatred, build a throne. Let's come together and worship the Lord. Todos juntos. We are a family, the family of God. Somos familia, familia de Dios. This is how the kingdom comes. This is how the kingdom comes. Venga tu reino. Venga tu reino. This is how the kingdom comes. Venga tu reino. Venga tu reino. This is how the kingdom comes. Venga tu reino. Venga tu reino. This is how the kingdom comes. Que venga tu reino, venga tu reino. This is how the kingdom comes. Que venga tu reino, venga tu reino. We are a family, the family of God. Somos family. We are a family, the family of God. So most familia, familia, we are. We are a family, the family of God. So most familia, familia, Dios. We are a family, the family of God. So most familia, familia, Dios. So I just wanted to say something. Um, I don't mean to interrupt what you guys have planned, but I know for me, um, going from thinking about my own failure <laughs> to singing that song was a little weird. Because um, that's kind of a triumphant song and a joyful song. But um, there's a scene in Ezra and Nehemiah where Ezra is reading the law to the people for the first time, and it's, um, it causes the people's hearts to be broken, and they begin to weep aloud because they haven't heard the law read uh, really in their lives, and they're realizing their own sin, and they're weeping, but then Ezra and the other leaders say, no, 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 don't, don't cry, like don't weep, don't mourn. This is actually a time to celebrate, and it's a time to... Um, well, to celebrate God's goodness in our lives for actually giving us, for giving us the law, for actually teaching us right and wrong and for making a way for redeeming us and restoring us even in the midst of our brokenness and failure. So I just was really reflecting on that. I have no idea if maybe for some of you guys you are going through that same kind of an experience of, man, I'm reflecting on my own failure and now we're singing a song about like joyfully being the family of God but actually, even in this story, like those things really do belong together in a really confusing but beautiful way. 
as Christians, those things belong together. Anyway, so I just wanted to encourage you with that to push in. So thanks for letting me interrupt you. This is how the kingdom comes. Thank God to the rain. Oh. Thank God to the rain. Oh. This is how the kingdom comes. Came thank God to rain. Oh. Thank God to rain. Oh. This is how the kingdom comes. Came thank God to rain. To reign, oh. This is how the kingdom comes. They got to reign, oh. they got to reign. Oh. We are a family. We are a family, the family of God. So most familiar, familiar to celebrating the victory of the resurrection of our Lord and seeing what that means for resurrection in our own lives. Hardly victory in the world's eyes. You life for me. A ransom life for me. You gave eternity. Redemption song I sing. Cause you made
your kingdom here. We thank you that you're already, things are already in motion, Lord. You're already working in subversive ways and some really obvious ways too sometimes, Lord. We thank you that we can see your hand moving. We can see your heart in the hearts of the humans that you created. Lord, we're not giving up on you, Lord. Sometimes it is really hard to see where you're working and where you're moving, Lord, but invite us into the work that you're doing, Father. Wherever you are, Lord, we want to be there. Prepare us for that work, Father. Heal our hearts, Lord. Heal our brokenness, Lord. Bring us closer to you, Lord. Draw us closer to you. So before I give you a benediction, um, I just want to encourage you. So we took some time to reflect and to identify a place of failure in our lives that we wanted to, to ask God to help us with. And um, maybe for some of you, you were able to identify something and um, you just need a little bit more direction for what to do with that. And uh, I just want to encourage you, something that I want to do personally and would encourage you to do is to take time each day this week and to reflect on that. Maybe you want to journal with it. Maybe you want to just pray to God about it. And really, I think I would just put two questions in front of you, right? Why? Right? So maybe this is something from your past or maybe it's something you can continue to struggle with. Why, why has this happened? Why did this failure occur? And the second question is, what is God's invitation in this? Where is the spirit at work? Right, just those two questions. And so again, maybe you're, you wanna write and journal or type or whatever, or you just wanna use those as prompts to prayer. But why has this happened? And God, where are you at work in it? Um, but maybe for some of you, this is significant enough that it's like, man, I need, like I would like somebody to talk to me about this, or I'd like somebody to pray for me with, uh, pray with me about this even before I leave. And I just want you to know that that, absolutely is available. So, you know, there's people you came in with, you can come talk to me or one of the other leaders and, um, you know, share as much or as little as you want and ask for prayer if that's something that you want. But again, respond to where God has prompted you to identify a place of failure in your life that you want to invite him into. And um, if you guys want to stand and I'll read a benediction and we'll call it a morning. And again, this is from Hebrews, one of my favorite benedictions. And the author of Hebrews says this, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I go in peace. new
giving our drinking, giving our breath, giving our breaking. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, got a little giddy for a second. Welcome to the Buffalo Vineyard. Uh, my name is Lauren. This is Greg. This is Kayla. We are going to be helping to facilitate a time of worship through music this morning for you. Uh, we don't want to be in the way. I know it's hard because you can see us, right? Just close your eyes and we'll disappear. But um, our point is to just be like, a tool in God's hands to help you to experience him through song in worship. So whatever you need to do to get in that place, that's up to you, and we invite all the things. Um, uh, Holy Spirit, we also invite you. We were talking earlier, and I was like, well, you're already here, so thanks for being here, and we just want to let you know that we are glad you are here, um, so move and have your way. 
Just have your way with us, Lord. Uh, we give all of this to you. Amen. All right. Come with singing.
Hardly victory. Hardly victory.
We invite your kingdom here. Have your way in and amongst us, through us, and around us. Draw us closer to you every day. We love you. And it's in your name that we pray and that we gather here today. Amen. Please have a seat, guys.
Good morning, guys. We've been working on our chords up here, which is nice. <laughs> we don't have to, like, <laughs> step over it. Um, yeah, good morning, 1030, guys. It's uh, good to see you. Welcome to Buffalo Vineyard Church. Uh, at Buffalo Vineyard, our mission is this, teaching people the way of King Jesus by regularly encountering God, training each other in the faith, and effectively serving our neighbors. Um, Zach, if you could go to the next slide. One of the ways we try to do this, um, all three of these things, sort of like formally, is through uh, Five Loaves Farm. Many of you guys here are definitely familiar with Five Loaves Farm. Uh, for anyone watching on the live stream, um, it's just it's a, a farm that uh, comprises about 14 or 15 lots, about a block from here. Um, just been slowly restoring them and, and turning them into some beautiful gardens that produce healthy food for our neighbors. Um, and last or yesterday, rather, uh, we just kicked off the first uh, contemplation and cultivation group of the season, which is exciting. Um, it's just basically a two-hour meeting where starting with a, an hour of contemplation time um, and study and fellowship and then uh, transitioning into just an hour or so of farm labor, farm volunteer work, uh, which at this time of year includes a lot of planting. I think Matt was saying they planted 3,000 onions yesterday, which is pretty wild. Um, and then we were and singing in that song that uh, Lauren and, and um, Zach wrote where it's talking about the garden coming alive. I think that's a really easy way to sort of regularly encounter God at this time of year, which is exciting. So if you're invited to be a part of that, that's, I think, runs all the way through the first week of November, uh, every Saturday at 10 o'clock. Next slide, please. Uh, another thing coming up next weekend is uh, Steve is launching his leadership development class small group, class, seminar, whatever he wants to call it. Um, and that's open to anybody, anyone who's, maybe you're an established leader, whether it's in your workplace or friends or family, whatever. Maybe you're not and you're just interested in um, exploring, maybe, yeah, just learning more about leadership. Uh, Steve's going to be starting that. That's going to be a monthly uh, small group meeting. That's going to start this Sunday which is the 18th uh, at 530 at 242 West Delavan, which is the church's new sort of auxiliary office space, 242 West Delavan. I, I just ask if you are coming to either let Steve or myself or uh, Elena know by sending us an email. We sent out an email this morning with a link to just respond to say, let me know if you want to come. Uh, and we'll be seeing another one out as well. It's going to be fun. Next slide, please. Last one is uh, I need you to fill out a survey. It's uh, very exciting stuff. We are, I don't know if anyone else misses, I, I, I certainly miss Patrick's presence here on a Sunday morning. Um, he's been primarily responsible for leading our, our communion every Sunday for a number of years. Obviously, last year, we had to put that on hiatus. So it, it is an important part of our gatherings on Sunday. So we are just trying to gauge where everyone is at. Um, yeah, we, we want we it's an important part of how we uh, gather together, but we don't want it to be a distraction for anyone either. So if you can go uh, either in the email we just sent out this morning or on our website, there's a little pop up. You can just go to our website that says, please so fill out the survey. It's basically two questions in a little comment section just to to know where everyone's at. So I would really appreciate it if you did that. And then lastly, we got kids time. just here coloring together and I'm about to tell my daughter the Easter story. Would you like to join us? Yeah! We're doing a puzzle today with stickers and stained glass art. Yeah, you want to show them the stickers? This one. Yeah, hold them 
up. See? Got some stickers. Uh -uh. And we put them on our stained glass window. All right. Try yeah. to put that one on. Where's that go? See it. It's hard to do, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Why don't you try again? I like this little sticky. It's a little sticky there, yeah. Yeah, it's You want me to do it? Okay, I can help you. Yeah, so we stick this big cloud right here. This one's hard because you gotta fit it all in the right places. Stick I it need in. the big cup. Yeah, now it's your turn to try again. You gonna get a big heart? Yeah, uh, is this a big one? You gonna get the big heart? Okay. Putting puzzle pieces together can be hard, right? I need this. And sometimes you just need to keep trying in order to get it in the right spot. Sometimes you need help from someone else. In the Bible, we're going to learn about stories such as Nehemiah, who was a man who was given a special project by God to rebuild some walls. They encountered difficulties eh. along the way. And he kept relying on God when he needed help. And kept trying to get the project done. Because that's what God gave him to do. So just like we're going to keep trying to put our puzzle together here. Together. You too can learn how to trust God to help you in your life as you go through it. And keep trying to follow after him every single day. So thanks for hanging out with us today, friends. <laughs> You want to show them the next next piece of the puzzle? You want to put this heart in? You want to put that cloud in? There you go. Just push it down really hard. I'll help you. You did it. Good job. High five. High five. You did it. Yay. You did it. High five. Cool. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? Well, good morning to everybody who's uh, watching from home or somewhere else this morning or later. So, um, yeah, thanks, John and Nora, for once again entertaining us and <laughs> as well as instructing us. So the, we're going to be jumping and I got to figure out how to do this here. There we go. That'll work. So we're going to be jumping into a series on Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, we're only going to spend probably four weeks doing this. Um, so we're not going to go verse by verse or line by line. Um, we will read some of the passages, but really just to tackle the whole, the whole story of Ezra and Nehemiah. And I'll get into it in a moment. Um, but but the, these two books are actually historically seen as one book. So that's why we're going to tackle them together. Um, but Part of the reason why we wanted to do this is uh, we're, we're actually going to be rethinking the way we do leadership as a church, um, and or rather I should say we have already rethought the way we want to do leadership as a church and are going to make some changes over the coming months about what that looks like. Um, and so I wanted to share some of that with you, and I think the, you know, the Having a conversation about that within the context of thinking about Ezra and Nehemiah I think makes a lot of sense. Um, there, Mark, you had the handouts in the back if people wanted them. Yeah, so there's a, there's a, a single sheet of paper that you guys can take a look at if you want to grab it. There's also something on our website that you can take a look at. Um, and I'm just going to pull some, some of the information off of our website um, to share with you what, what we have planned. Um, 
I, I personally am super excited about this, and I feel like this represents a lot of change for me personally. It may or may not represent a lot of change for other people in the church, um, but again, I think it's something really exciting. Uh, and so really, so for starters, we're not changing like the mission or vision of our church. So in that sense, those aren't things that are changing, but we are making some structural changes around how leadership works. Um, and, you know, we licensed Gail as a pastor over the last year. We're going to be licensing a few more pastors, right? So we're actually going to have more pastors involved in leading. And really the reason for this is ultimately it's about aligning people's skill and their passion with the work that they're doing. Like really at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Um, so whether you're talking about me or Gail or some of the other pastors that we're going to license, giving us roles that align with hopefully as much as possible what we're good at and what we enjoy doing. I think that that for obvious reasons, um, I think that that uh, like what we're hoping will come out of that is again like joy and passion but also fruitfulness and focus and ministry. Um, and so what we're doing, like I said, uh, licensing some new pastors. So we're going to be licensing Zach um, Lopez as a pastor and he's going to be stepping into um, a role in addition to his role as our worship leader really focus well so that you guys are familiar you know Mark just just stood up here and talked about the um, the mission of our church right teaching people in the way of King Jesus but that as a part of that we want to be regularly encountering God training each other in the faith and effectively serving our neighbors and so we're going to ask Zach to take that first part of that and really focus in on that what does it mean to help us as a congregation regularly encounter God, right? And that's something that Zach is going to be giving his focus and attention to. Um, there's, we still have one person that we haven't yet identified, um, but having somebody whose job is, again, helping us as a church train each other in the faith, right? That we're gathering together and encouraging each other and getting deeper into each other's lives. And then Gail, Pastor Gail Schlosser, she's going to be the person who is going to focus in on the, like the missional aspect of our, our mission, right? Um, of, about effectively serving our neighbors and helping us as a congregation to do that corporately um, with our you know, West Side Outreach team or even just to equip us as individuals to be people who are you know, sharing our faith or serving our neighbors in ways that actually bless them, right? So those are some changes that are coming. And then also, um, so we're going to be licensing Mark Harley and Mark is going to be stepping into more of like an executive pastor role um, taking on uh, more leadership with the leadership team and and with the kind of the operations of the church, so to speak. And we've also hired Elena France to take on some of the more administrative roles that, that Mark has been doing. And then finally, my role is going to shift a little bit. So I'll still be like the person largely responsible for preaching and still be available to like meet with people, but really focusing in on leadership development and pouring into the leadership team and also you know, you guys are probably familiar with the fact that I do a lot of networking outside of the church, but focusing in on some of that stuff too. So those are some of the just changes that we're making. Um, and like I said, I'm really excited about that. It's something that I, I, I feel like lines up my passion and my skill with, with the work that I'm going to be doing, and we feel the same about everyone else. Maybe when it comes to how that affects the church, you know, it may or may not make some some radical shifts in the way our the culture of our church works, but we do believe that this will make us more fruitful in our mission, right? That we're, we will be able to actually do the things that we are doing better and more. Uh, let's see, did I miss anything else? Right, yeah, so just in terms of the process of change, I mean, again, I've been thinking about and praying about this for some time, and so it feels really monumental to me. Maybe for some of you guys hearing me talk about this, it feels big or it feels small, um, but we're committed to making sure that whatever change we go through, it's like a healthy process. So if you have any questions, you can ask, you can talk to me, any of other leaders, you know, hey, why are we doing this? Or who was involved? Or, you know, what, what's this going to look like? Or you, you can ask whatever questions you want. Um, and yeah, again, just be praying for the church as we go through this. Does that sound good? Cool. All right. So, <coughs> excuse me. Ooh, that was bad. I tried. I got I, I to learn how to do that. That did not work. All right, so Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, so first of all, this, and, and I would encourage you to read this. So we're not going to, you know, I'm, I've got like 25, 30 chapters of scripture that we're looking at this morning. So I'm not going to read through the whole thing. We're not even really going to be able to read through the whole thing as a church over the next four weeks. But I would encourage you to read read it. Read Ezra and Nehemiah 
um, over the next week. It's not too much to do. Uh, and, and there's a lot of really cool stuff in it. But this is a story that actually takes place over about 100 years, right? These two books, um, there's 100 years of history there. And there's five different Persian emperors or kings um, whose reign spans this, the, the tale of this story. And it is, it's the story of God's people being brought back to their homeland after a time of exile in Babylon and in Persia. Right? That's what this is the story of. It's the story of the return. And in it are um, like just some real practical, tangible things that need to be rebuilt. Like Nehemiah rebuilds a wall, right? And um, uh, Zerubbabel and, and Joshua, the, the first governor and priest, they rebuild the altar in the temple, right? So they're rebuilding physical structures. But also there is the reestablishment of worship, like re- reestablishing the, the identity of the Jewish people as God's covenant people, reestablishing the practice of the law and the holiness and the righteousness of God's people, reestablishing practices of justice and how you know rich and poor people are supposed to interact and treat each other as God's people. Like all, it's all of this. So s- certainly there's some really big, tangible, just physical projects that involve you know rocks and carpenters and then there's also some deeply spiritual work that is involved in the the rebuilding and restoration of the people of God into their homeland right and so that's the story but it's also it's a story about um what God's sovereignty as well uh we'll we'll get into this in just a moment that this whole thing the whole story hinges upon God doing things for his people that they can't do for themselves. And you see opposition coming from the neighbors and even sometimes from people within the nation of Israel itself who are resistant to what is going on and to what God is doing. Uh, They they send letters, people write letters to the the Persian kings and sometimes they stop the work and sometimes they, they, you know, spend money on the work. and, And so there's just this sense of, Man, we need God to show up and to make this work for us or nothing's going to happen. We're, you know, the Jewish people had no power and no authority at this point in their history. And they were dependent upon God to move in the hearts of much more powerful empires and much more powerful people to allow them to, to be faithful to what God was calling them to. And so that's the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and so this is, I mean, in many ways, this is a really powerful, beautiful, hopeful, glorious story, right? Story about leadership and and faithfulness and rebuilding and restoration. But today we're going to focus in on really kind of a different a different side of the story, right? And so this is my working title for this morning's message. Um, rebuilding in the debris of catastrophic failure, right? So that's like, uh, <laughs> woohoo, that sounds like fun. Let's do that. But at At the same time, that's what this story is about. As much as this is the story of God bringing his people back out of his own sovereign grace to to their homeland, it's also about the fact that a generation or two earlier, God in his sovereignty had to punish the nation of Israel for their abject failure, right? And he's bringing them back to the place where their once great nation had built a beautiful city where God's temple was and all of it's gone. It is gone, right? And so there really is this sense of, man, we're coming back as a people to deal with the consequences of our own moral failure and to step into this place where we have to, we have to take responsibility for that and, and maybe even <laughs> just say yes as God takes responsibility for that because we don't even have the ability to take responsibility for it ourselves. And so that's really also an important part of what this story is about. So that doesn't sound necessarily like fun and happy and, you know, like let's sing songs of joy, but at the same time, I think we can all recognize how important that is, right? And, you know, probably, you know, when you think about rebuilding in the debris of catastrophic failure, I would imagine that that resonates with every single one of us, that all of us have done things in our lives that really could only be described as catastrophically failures, right? It's like, man, I can't, I mean, it's, I, can, I could list off quite a few events in my life 
that I would describe as Steve's catastrophic failures. And if you are at all self-aware, and if you're anything like me, <laughs> you probably get, at least got a few things on that list yourself, right? So as much as that's not a pleasant thing to dwell on, it's, a, it's an important thing for us to chew on and wrestle with. So, so this is a story of restoration, right? And, and it is that, and we can't lose sight of that. And so it, it, there, there should be a note of hope. And I want to read um, from the very beginning of the book of Ezra, just the first few verses. You can turn there if you want. Ezra 1, I want to read 1 through 4. So in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation through his realm and also put it into writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So that's pretty cool, right? I mean, that's, that's a great start to the story. <laughs> the most powerful person on earth God has, and, and again, that's a part of the story, right, is we have these powerful human beings, but then you have God kind of like doing whatever he feels like doing with them, and that's very much a part of this story. So Cyrus, most powerful emperor on earth in, in his day, and God is directing his heart and his will, and so Cyrus ends up issuing this decree saying, hey, if you're a Jewish person, I've decided that I'm going to rebuild the temple of your God. You're free to go. Um, people, you know, other citizens of my empire, give these people some gifts so that they can go and rebuild this temple, right? That's a pretty cool start to the story. Um, and, and we see the first six chapters really are, so Zerubbabel is the first uh, governor, and Joshua is the first priest, and they lead a group of people from, uh, from the Persian empire, from Babylon, back to Jerusalem, uh, and they begin to rebuild the, first they rebuild the altar, and then they, they begin to rebuild the temple. And that's the beginning of that. And then after that, we see Ezra the scribe come. Like I said, the story spans about 100 years. So Ezra the scribe comes, and he begins to teach the people the law, right? To teach them the practice of the Jewish law again, and what it means to be God's covenant people, to be faithful to God, and to be just and righteous and holy, to, to worship in ways that, that are pleasing to God. And then we see Nehemiah come and Nehemiah takes over as the, the, the next governor and, and his task is to rebuild the walls as an infrastructure project, but also to begin to deal with some of the ways that the people of God have not treated each other fairly or have not lived up to uh, the call of God on their lives, right? And so that's the story of well, it's, it's restoration and all of these holistic depictions of restoration, right? And we're going to get into this in the coming weeks. It's restoring their relationship to God, restoring their relationship to each other, restoring their relationship to the city and to the land, right? Restoring their sense of identity and purpose and self-worth, all of the, these things. And so as much as we're going to dig into the, the, the disappointing reality of sin, this still is a, a story about restoration, Right? But it's also a story about dealing with the desolation that is the fruit of sin, right? That really is very much what this story is about. And, and this shows up time and again in the, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. And I want to read to you from Ezra chapter 3. And we're reading, yeah, verse 10 through 14. So this comes prior to Ezra's arrival on the scene. Zerubbabel and Joshua have come, they've built the altar, uh, and then they've laid the foundation for the temple. So the, it's an outside altar with the foundation of the temple built around it, but they haven't built the temple yet. And they have a worship service, right? And this is what we read. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. 
With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good, His love towards Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. It's a huge celebration, right? And I don't know, we don't use symbols and trumpets, investments and things like that in our church. But again, it's like, man, the, I don't know, the drums were banging and the... (laughs) The guitar was wailing, and I don't know, whatever, whatever language you want to put it into, right? And people are shouting, and people are excited, and it's a celebration because the, the, they're worshiping God again in Jerusalem in front of the altar. The, temple of the, the foundation of the temple has been laid. But in verse 12, we read this. But many of the older priests and the Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sounds of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. And so this is huge noise. I don't know if you've ever been, you know, like maybe by the Bills Stadium outside it when like they're playing a game and it gets like that's that's what's going on around the temple is this giant crowd of people making tons of noise that could be heard, you know, miles away. But we read that certainly there are shouts of joy, but there's also weeping and sadness. And some of the commentaries that I've read point at the size of the original temple versus the size of the new temple, right? And that that maybe they were weeping because they knew that the former glory of God's temple was not going to be reclaimed. Um, So whether it's that or it's just simply the reality that for, you know, a hundred years there had been no temple and there still wasn't a temple. It was just a foundation, right? So whatever the case is, the the reality of the fact that they, they were still living in the desolation caused by the faithlessness of the Jewish people. They were living with it, looking at it. And as much as this is a celebration, we're here, we're back, we're worshiping. Yeah, but look at what we've lost. Look at what has been, you know, what is the cost to us because of our failure as a people, right? And that that too is a part of this story. And I mean, that, that is what starts this whole story, right? So Ezra starts with this joyful announcement from Cyrus, but that's not really where the story starts. They're, they're in exile because God brought Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian armies to Jerusalem and leveled the city and hauled all of the people off to be slaves and exiles in another country. And so the, this is this reckoning with judgment and reckoning with failure. Um, You know, I mean, what what would it be like to live through like the great fire that burned down Buffalo and to survive and come back to the city? And I mean, this is our home, you know? This is the city that we love and we have places that we eat and a church that we worship in and, you know, a DMV that maybe we don't like to go to, but we're glad that it's, you know, it's like, and it's just burned to the ground. And to come back and to walk through it, you know, and to be the people that are, we're here to rebuild it. And that's exciting, but also, holy cow, like it's just gone. And that's a fire that, you know, I mean, I guess the equivalent would be if you're the one who set the fire, you know, it's like your fault. And, you know, the, 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 the consequences of sin are even deeper than that. Their neighbors didn't want them to return. Right, they're dealing with opposition from the people groups around them. Even the, the, the citizens of Israel, they had been violating the law of God even up until that moment. Right? They're still not following God's law. One of the, one of the major themes of um, the, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is God had told them, don't intermarry with the people that are there. You need to be your own people group. You need to maintain your sense of identity as my people and worship me because the practices of some of the people there will lead you astray. So don't, don't learn from them and don't follow them and don't, don't give yourselves to their way of life. And the Jewish people were doing that, right? And, and so Ezra and Nehemiah have to deal with that too. The fact that the very people that God has brought back to be his people in their homeland are still not living up to the covenant that they had with him. And so again, this is a story about dealing with the desolation that comes from sin.
but also one of the major themes of the story of Ezra and Nehemiah is the story of God intervening, right? And this is a picture of a shepherd carrying a sheep. Um, you guys are all familiar, I'm sure, with the parable of uh, Jesus and the, the lost sheep, the good shepherd who, you know, leaves the 99 to go after the one. It's, uh, it's told with the, the parable of the lost coin and the bar- parable of the lost son, right? But the, it's, it's Jesus's way of communicating God's heart, right? That God's heart is to see one of his sheep who through its foolishness or its stubbornness or um, its rebelliousness has wandered away from the herd, from the good place that he's led it. And instead of being angry or leaving the sheep to its own devices, God is like a good shepherd who goes out and goes after and rescues the sheep, not because it's a good sheep, but because he's a good shepherd, right? And so he goes after the sheep. And that's what this is the story of, right? This is the story of God redeeming and restoring his people, not because of their goodness or their faithfulness, but because of his own. And God continually shows up in the story of Ezra and Nehemiah to take care of his people. One of the really cool, <laughs> so, so the, the, the nations around Israel, around, around the Jewish people, around Jerusalem, they keep writing letters to the Persian kings saying, hey, you can't let this people rebuild because they'll rebel against you. And keeps trying to like interfere with the work they're doing, you know, showing up to try and sow discord in the, in the, the camp and doing all these things. And so there's this one point where they, they write a letter to one of the Persian kings saying, hey, don't, don't let them build. And the Persian king looks into the situation and realizes, oh, my predecessor has actually said that this is, you know, Cyrus said this is what's supposed to happen. So you people that wrote me this letter, not only are they allowed to build, but you guys have to pay for the building project, right? And it's like, oh man, that's like, how much more evidence do you need of like God's favor on this project that that's how this unfolds, right? And so there's all of these places in the story where you just see Again, people who think they have power and authority and God's like moving around like chess pieces for on behalf of his people. And so again, you just see God's faithfulness coming through in this story. But again, it's God's faithfulness to redeem and to restore that which was lost through human sin. And that really is the story. So just a couple thoughts about what this means for us. Like, how do we, how do we put this into some sort of practice for ourselves? And, um, I mean, you guys are probably familiar with the fact that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. And I would imagine many of you guys have heard the story. So he, I don't know exactly how many times, but he tried and failed like a thousand times to, to make a light bulb before he finally successfully built a light bulb. And somebody asked him, you know, what does it feel like to fail that many times? And his response was something along the lines of, oh, I didn't fail a thousand times. I see, I, a, a thousand times I successfully figured out how to not build a light bulb. That was his response, right? And um, I'm not a historian on the life of Thomas Edison, but my understanding is he was not really known for his humility, right? He was kind of, I think, more of like an arrogant figure. But I think there's something in that approach that speaks to what's going on in this story, that there, I guess there's a deep conviction that you see, particularly in Ezra and Nehemiah. They're, they're not willing to give up. They're pushing in, right? There's, there's all sorts of opposition coming from all sorts of sides. Um, they're walking into a disaster area, and yet they're continuing to push forward. There's this moral courage and conviction that they possess. And yet there is also, I think, like a humility that is coupled with that, like a recognition of the the failure that is going on, right? And those two things are put together in, I think, a really interesting way, something that we have to, I think that's just part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, is to have that kind of conviction and determination coupled with a tremendous amount of humility because the moral courage or the conviction or the, the determination that we have as believers, it's not, it's not based on our own ability. It's not based on our own goodness, right? It's based on his. It's based on his faithfulness and his goodness and his grace. And so that gives us 
It should give us a lot of courage and conviction, but it doesn't give us any room for ego or pride at the same time, right? Does that make sense? And so I think that you see that in this story, and I'm going to read uh, one of the prayers from Ezra, but Nehemiah also has a prayer that's similar, where it's just this heartfelt uh, repentance and lament of personal and corporate sin. But again, it points these people in a direction where they're just unwavering. They're moving forward towards what God has called them to do. And so, you know, we have to ask questions like, well, what, like what would tempt us to not, be, to not engage with that kind of conviction, right? And, you know, the reality for me, I, like, I don't like looking at my failures. I don't like dealing with the consequences of my sin. I don't think anybody does. Right? It's not fun. It's not pleasant. And I don't like to do things that aren't pleasant or fun. Now, that's me. Maybe you guys are exactly the same or maybe it's a little different for you. But the reality is, is that we're all tempted to just avoid that. Yeah, that was yesterday's mistake. I'll just move on to the next day. And the reality is, is that we have to be people who are actually willing to push into those hard, painful things. And on the other side, we can be tempted to be people who rely on ourselves, who think we have our act together and put on a front or a mask and just, you know, fake it. And the reality is, is that we need to be people who choose to rely on God's grace and choose to rely on God's goodness in our lives. And that, again, leads us to be people who have that deep sense of conviction and courage and determination while simultaneously being people who are humble and who are not wrapped up in our own, in our own ego. So that speaks for itself, right? I think. I always thought that, that would be fun to like go to the county fair and like try and sell that, right? Set up a booth for accepting responsibility. <laughs> right, right next to one that says blame others, you probably would get that response, right? Everybody's lining up next to you, not at your table. And, and so the reality is, is that accepting responsibility is not something that is pleasant. It's not something that it's enjoyable. But the reality also is, is that, you know, we can do things that are unpleasant. We're capable of doing hard things in our lives. And this is actually one of those things that is, while it's not pleasant, it is good for us to do, right? I mean, it would be a horrible story if God called Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel and Joshua to come and rebuild the city and they said, nah, that sounds difficult, right? Cyrus issues his decree and no Jews want to return. That would be a horrible story, right? And so the fact that these people were faithful to go back and to rebuild in spite of what it cost them to do that, like that's a worthy task. It's a worthy call. It's a worthwhile sacrifice for them to make. And you know, for us to be people who step into the pain of our, you know, personal dumb decisions or the dumb decisions that maybe we've made as a church or in our neighborhood or in our city or as a nation or for us to be people who are willing to step in and take responsibility and accountability for those things, it's not fun, but it's worthy and it's good and it's what God wants for us. So this picture, I um, I came across it and and it just captured the, <laughs> the idea of failure for me so perfectly. Uh, and then I was like, well, I should probably find something that's a little bit more meaningful than like a spilled ice cream cone. But again, you guys probably can all remember experiences like this as a child and just like the complete despairing disappointment that comes along with something like this, right? You know, it's like, oh, my, I had this, it's gone and it's there on the ground and I could just stare at it. And, um, How many of you guys watch uh, American Idol? Anybody watch that? Mm, a little bit? Okay. So I've never actually watched American Idol, but with my kids, I have watched YouTube videos of audition failures. Have you guys ever watched those? Who's watched those? Okay, all right. <laughs> They're kind of sad, but also a lot funnier than the, uh, the, the Idol success stories. But what, I mean, what that is, is that they're people who think they know how to sing and they find out that they can't sing in front of millions of people, right? So that's, that's bad, that is not good. And the reality of that is that these are people either through their own decisions or the decisions of their friends and family have never actually really been forced to confront 
personal failure. And this is about singing or performing, so, you know, it's not necessarily a, not necessarily a moral failure to not be able to sing, but I think it gets at the importance of being people who are willing to just look at the places where we've failed. I know for me, as, a, as an athlete, it, it never felt good to lose, ever, right? You spend years, hours, sweating, you know, bleeding, training, sacrificing to go succeed, and then you don't, you fail, and it's miserable, it doesn't feel good. And then to have your coach pull you aside and say, all right, let's talk about why you failed. That doesn't feel good either. And yet, those were some of the most formative things for me as an athlete, but also for me as a person, right? To be able to say, all right, this is where I made a mistake. This is where I made a mistake in competition. This is where I made a mistake in training. This is where I made a mistake in my character. This is where I made a mistake in who to trust or whatever. Like, these are the places where my actions led to failure. And, and that's something that, you know, again, as athletes, that gets built into the athletic process, the competition process. Uh, and, and this is a story about God building that into the process of his people, right? That, no, we have to actually go back and confront this and deal with this. You know, the, in many ways, this is the story of my life as a Christian is coming to terms with, you know, the, the pain and suffering in my life and the fact that I really couldn't point my finger at anybody else around me who had done it to me. It was my own rebelliousness and my own sinfulness and my own decision making that had led to some of the catastrophic failures and painful things in my life. And it was that realization that brought me back to Jesus. Where it's like, all right, I, I have to actually be willing to acknowledge that I did this to myself. Um, <laughs> I could tell you lots of stories about fights with my wife that fall into that category. She's a jerk. No, I'm a jerk. <laughs> I'm the jerk, right? And there's something inside of me that pushes against that always. I don't ever want to acknowledge that. But the reality is, is if I'll sit and listen and pay attention and reflect on what happened, I don't think I've ever been in a fight with my wife where I wasn't at least partly the jerk, right? And that's not a fun thing to come to terms with, but it's the only way I'll become less of a jerk, <laughs> right? That doesn't happen any other way. So there's one last passage that I want to read to you out of, um, out of the, the Ezra story. And this is Ezra chapter 9. And then we'll time, take some time to reflect a little bit personally. And like I said, there's multiple passages like this in this story. But this is Ezra chapter 9. And we're going to read verse 5 through 15. And this is, uh, really, it's a prayer of repentance and lament that Jeremiah, or I'm sorry, that uh, Ezra offers. Then at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement with my tunic and cloak torn and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God, and I prayed, I am too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up my face to you because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our ancestors until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hands of foreign kings as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he's given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, our God, what can we say after this? For we have forsaken the commands you gave through your servants, the prophets, when you said the land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices, they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore, do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt 
And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we then break your commands again and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? Lord, the God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it, not one of us can stand in your presence. So that's a, I mean, that's a powerful and yet, I don't know if dark is the right word, heavy, heavy prayer, right? Um, But I would imagine every one of you has prayed a prayer like that in your life, right? When confronting your own foolishness, stupidity, evil, you name it. God, like you're good. I'm not. I don't know what to do about this. Thank you for sparing me so far. I know I don't deserve it. God, please help me deal with this. Make me into the man or the woman that you want me to be, right? And that's, again, it's not a pleasant thing to deal with. It's not an enjoyable thing to deal with, but it is an incredibly important thing for us as people to do. Right? And so we're going to take some time uh, to just reflect a little bit. And I've got a, just got a little bit of a guide for reflection um, to identify a place of personal failure that you're willing to actually dig into with God's help. Right? And you, you, I'm not telling you what to do. Right? You can pick something. So big, small. Uh, but it takes courage to push into something like this. Right? To say, okay, I'm willing to point at something in my life that I know represents less than what God wants for me. And I'm willing to then, that's the second line, commit to God in prayer. God, I want to work on this. I need your help. Help me to deal with this place in my life. Right, and so we're going to take some time to do that. And, you know, be, be as courageous as you're, as you're capable of being. Right, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, share anything with anybody here or, it, but, but do some business with God around this. So I'm gonna invite the Spirit to come and you guys can listen and respond in prayer to him. And at some point, I'll bring us back together and we'll, we'll close the service. So Lord, we just pray that you would be, give us courage. Give us courage. Help us to identify not, not the place of greatest sin or smallest sin, but the place that you want to focus. Be gracious to us, God. And again, we just pray that your spirit would move and speak.
So Lord, we just thank you that you're gracious and present to help us deal with, well, to deal with our own failure and our own sin and also what it means to live among people who have failed and have sinned. So we thank you for your graciousness to us, Lord. So maybe a couple of things that I want to encourage you with before I dismiss you. Um, There's a, a story in Nehemiah, part of this story, where Ezra reads the law to the people and they begin to cry. They begin to weep because they haven't heard the law read and they realize essentially like they haven't been living the way God wanted them to live. And in that moment, um, Ezra and Nehemiah and the other leaders encourage them not to cry, but actually to celebrate. Like there's a time for repentance and there's a time for, for weeping, but right now, like this is actually a time to recognize that God is doing some restorative work and to be excited about that. And that's not to say that we should be excited about confronting our own failure, but to recognize that it's actually a part of the process of restoration. This is actually a story of hope and restoration. I think this morning, it's important for us to recognize that restoration doesn't happen without dealing with the consequences of failure and sin, and that that can't be shortchanged or ignored. But it also, like, our eyes should also, like, we should be able to see to the future hope as well, right? And that's an important thing for us. So I want to just put that as an encouragement in front of you, but also give you a little bit of practical guidance, right? So maybe for some of you, you identified something and you need to do something more with that. Um, so what I'm planning on doing for myself this week is journaling over the, the course of the week around that specific place that I feel like God wants to deal with in me. And just two questions, so I'll give these to you, right? What, what, why am I failing or why have I failed in that place? What's the reason why? And just to put some thought, and my guess would be you probably don't actually know as clearly as God does. So just to do some work over the course of the next week answering that question, why has this failure happened? And the second is, where is God at work in it? Right? Where is the spirit at work? Where is God inviting me into something different? Where is he being sovereign in his approach to what's happened? And so just those two questions. So you, you know, if, you're, if you like to journal, journal. If you just want to take that with you into times of prayer every day this week, I would encourage you to do that. Um, but also, if maybe there's something that God has put on your heart that you know is bigger than your ability to just deal with and you want to talk to somebody else about it, you can, right? I think everybody in the room came in with somebody. You can talk to the person you came into the room with. You can come talk to me. You can talk to one of the other leaders of our church, or maybe you have a mentor somewhere that you feel comfortable going to them and saying, hey, we took this time of reflection during church, and I identified this place of personal failure that I feel like God wants me to deal with. Can you help me, or can you pray for me, or can I share this with you? So don't, don't walk away feeling like you're alone in something like that, okay? Well, so why don't we stand? And I will pray a benediction over you guys. So the author of Hebrews says this. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the... Occur Let's try that again. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.